Thank you so much, uh, Sivan, for the great introduction. And also thank you for mentioning Michael Young because I just couldn't fit that anecdote into my talk anymore. So you're giving all the context that I needed. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Elisa Lindinger. Um, as Sivan already said, I'm the co-founder and manager of uh, Superlab, which is a Berlin-based nonprofit. And I'm um, going to talk today about meritocracy, open source, and funding. Thank you for giving me the opportunity today to share a bit about uh, my work, um, my past work, to be more precise. So let's start and let me give you uh, a quick overview of one to, uh, what I want to share with you today. We'll start with a bit of context about myself and also, most of all, the work that my colleagues and I did in the field of open source funding and also research on that field. And we look um, at the report that is at the center of this talk, which bears the title Roadwork Ahead. And while the scope of the report naturally is more broad, um, today I'll spotlight a few of the fun findings that we came across that relate to meritocracy, especially how merit in open source communities is assigned and how funding influences these communities and also the mechanisms of meritocratic structures. The report itself closes with recommendations for funders um, of FOSS projects that I believe are also relevant for FOSS communities themselves. So that's where we are going to end as well. And as Sivan already said, um, in 2016, I started working for the Prototype Fund, which is Germany's first public funding program that supports individual software developers, either on their own or like in small teams, to work on their open source projects. I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with the Prototype Fund, so I'll keep it short. It supports people for six months to bring their idea to a prototype stage. It funds projects in four categories, which are civic tech, data literacy, IT security, and digital infrastructure. And our role at the Prototype Fund was, of course, to manage the calls for applications and to support the grantees, but also to evaluate this public funding program. And during this evaluation work, we found that digital infrastructure projects um, had a much harder time to actually successfully apply for our funding, even though we really wanted to support them. We just didn't ask the right questions. We didn't offer the right forms of support, apparently. And we really couldn't quite figure out what the final reasons were, why those projects kind of fell through. And we were very happy that we received um, an additional grant that, uh, from the Digital Infrastructure Research RFP that also supported the work of Ayiri and Jessica that was just uh, presented. And um, this grant allowed myself and other people from the Prototype Fund to look into FOSS communities and where our work exactly did not work out as planned. And because this kind of happened as an, another project on top of our work, it has a different name. It, we called the project IDE, Implicit Development Environments. And um, this is basically something that ended in a number of reports that were authored. One of them was authored by myself and the other one was authored by Katharina Meyer. I don't want to make things more complicated, but the past years have been tumultuous with the pandemic and everything. So now I'm not part of the prototype fund anymore. I founded a nonprofit that is based in, in uh, Berlin, in Germany, which is called Superlab. Um, but so I'm not part of the prototype fund anymore, but you should definitely check out uh, the work that my former colleagues do there. It's, it's, it's a fantastic program. So what is all that about the ominous report called Roadwork Ahead? Um, first of all, the title, of course, is meant as a homage to Nadia Ekbal's book, Roads and Bridges, which I highly recommend in case you haven't read it yet. And with Roadwork Ahead, we evaluated the needs of FOSS communities that work on digital infrastructure in the public interest when it comes to funding for that sector. It also shows how funding programs fall short to provide specific forms of support that FOSS communities need and how funding can lead to unintended consequences. 
If you want to check it out, you can find it online, uh, a clickable version and also a PDF to download and read later um, under the URL recommendations.implicit-development.org. Let me give you a quick summary of the scope and the content of the report. It's based on qualitative interviews and follows a human-centered design pattern. We conducted 26 interviews in total with people that contribute to a, a number of FOSS projects in different ways as employees, as freelancers or volunteers, um, as developers, as community managers, as fundraisers or generally as networkers and communicators. And because of our special interest in infrastructure projects, we focused on people or projects that work on standards, that implement them, that maintain these implementations, or run a service on them. The report formulates four different project types that also need different things from funders to thrive, ranging from the one-person shop, how we called it, I guess it's more commonly known as the infamous random maintainer in Nebraska, to proper organizations with a legal structure that employ people, collaborate with other organizations or businesses, and have a community of freelancers or paid staff even, or volunteers. The report formulates 10 insights into the work these communities do, how they are organized, how they perceive themselves and how they deal with resources. And also, of course, what their strengths and weaknesses in that respect are. And connected to these 10 insights are 30 recommendations for funders on how to better position themselves if they want to support open digital infrastructure. For today, I've selected three of those insight that's insights that show how meritocracy is at play in FOSS communities um, that we talk to, how it influences their strengths and weaknesses and their relationships with funders. So let me start with the first one. Uh, yeah, and the first insight that I want to share is um, quite obvious if you if you think about it um, the insight is there is a uniform path that leads people into open digital infrastructure projects or if you want to turn it the other way around paths into FOSS are limited very limited so what does that mean people's paths into FOSS projects usually follow the same route individual people spend sometimes months, sometimes even more than a year to read mailing lists, follow discussions, they try to make sense of the code on their own before they actually start to actively take part in discussions and also before they start committing code. And the fact that people need to put in so much time and work is seen as um, ne is necessary for newcomers to prove their commitment and also to be taken seriously, so to gain merit in a way. Our interviewees were aware that this status quo, this path, strongly favors people that um, are privileged to have access to computers early in their youth. They can teach themselves. They also have time on their hands in, in, the, in the here and now. They have resources that they can shift to make that kind of voluntary work in the beginning possible. And the prevailing sentiment is, yeah, that's not optimal, but it is necessary to guarantee independence of the project and also a quality of work. So this rather arbitrary pre-selection affects the lack of diversity in infrastructure projects in several ways. First of all, it limits the skill sets that are present in the community. If people join a community by contributing code, the result is, of course, that only developers join the community. And people with other non-technical skills who might be very much needed once the project grows and, and needs different things, they don't have a true way, a normal way of entering the community. Of course, it also selects for financial background, um, people with a steady, without a steady income or the backing of a financially stable environment have a hard time working their way into a project to the point where they are accepted as a contributor. There is no guarantee for people without those resources in the back that the time that they spend on a project will at some point pay off financially, whether that be in form of contracts or job opportunities. It's important to understand that uh, people who make it that far, 
people who have passed all these unspoken hurdles and have arrived and have been accepted to a community can be part of the meritocratic structure of open source. And I'm not doubting that the, the work that they have done is worth it, not at all. But others that were not able to follow that path basically have no way to become part of the structure of open source and of meritocracy and to prove themselves in a meaningful way. So as a result, that process have a self-affirming quality. If only developers make it into communities, their work must be of value and hence developer positions need to be more supported than others. To quote from one of the interviews, um, the person said, what we really need is, is a community person to, to manage us and to facilitate communication and also to mediate. But the acceptance for that is missing in the community. We need the money to produce code. So the initial filter mechanism for FOSS communities is not merit, it's resources. People who can spend time, work often as volunteers or redirect the resources, I already said that. So let's face it, people who are culturally similar in our societies. So meritocracy becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The second insight is that um, non-coding work and value are quite unbalanced. So what happens if, if the path into FOSS projects is by contributing code? And what if, as a result, the community consists mostly of developers and engineers? Well, they are the ones who will have to do the work that needs to be done to keep the project afloat, which, of course, also consists of non-technical work, which is project management, financial administration, design, community management, event organization, coordination with other projects, companies, and public speaking, for example. And this work in our inter interview was seen either as a burden or as an annoyance, sometimes as an unwelcome surprise, and sometimes it was a nice little side hobby. So these non-coding tasks are taken over by developers involved in the project because there's no one else to take them up. And the developers recognize that they are not very much qualified for this work and they often are not very interested in doing it. And that's a source of frustration because it keeps them from what they like to do, the joyful task of coding. So. On the other hand, it's not easy for them to delegate that task because no one presents themselves as, hey, I'm equipped to do that. Um, just, you know, let me do it. And in spite of frequent complaints uh, in our interviews about this work, um, even in fields where there were community management roles, uh, fundraising roles, um, administrative roles, they were not that much valued. They were often not part of the communication structures. They were sometimes not really seen as the developer's team, but at, I don't know, team adjacent. And there was one interesting thing that we came across. Um, so when the developers were undertaking non-developer work, they, um, favored technical fixes for non-technical projects. And I'm sure you've come across, uh, uh, across that once, at least. One example for that is the social fork, where a lack of um, community work and care work in a project leads to massive social friction. And instead of solving the problem on a social level, parts of the community actually fork the code and establish a new tech project partly to circumvent this kind of friction, these social tensions that have arisen or even abusive behavior. And the last insight I, I want to share is um, where the funders actually come in. So what happens if funders step onto the stage? Funders tend to support the existing structures that they find in a project. They also like to focus on project work, developer positions, for example, sometimes also design, and not so much the structural support that is needed to build a thriving community, to set up financial reporting and all the things that you have to do if you want to live um, yeah, in the long run. So on the other hand, what funders support sends a message of value. Funding becomes a factor that reaffirms this kind of assumed meritocracy, the value of certain positions in tech. 
There is another influence that funders have. They prefer to support new projects. I believe we all know that this kind of innovation driven approach. Um, so like community work or finances, maintenance is also not on their list of things they support. Another example of a very dearly needed position of very needed work that doesn't receive the acclaim and not the merit that it deserves. There's one other thing that we saw in funder grantee relationships, um, and that was kind of a vicious cycle. Funders, on the one hand, found that um, a community is heavily focusing on developers and they want to add and support these highly valued positions. FOSS communities, on the other hand, that needed the funding, so they tried to um, preemptively I don't know, ideal, um, you know, figure out what the funders wanted to hear, which kind of things they wanted to support. And they assumed that they are focusing on the tech aspect, on the developer position. So even if they wanted to apply for community positions, for example, they did not do it because they believed that their application was, would not be well received, would not be seen as worthy. So I guess it's about time that we all talk, communities and researchers and funders alike, about this kind of imbalance to give open source communities the support that they actually need. So what can we actually take from that? Um, it might sound like, I don't know, like a damning status report, a, a, a bad description of open source infrastructure communities. It really isn't. Open source is awesome. I'm the first person to say that. And we need these communities and their work. Because where infrastructure, where open infrastructure is absent, privatized, and often exploitative business models predominate. We see that all around. And these business models commodify people. They harm the communities that are most vulnerable, both in the physical and in the digital world. And while the existence of public infrastructure and public open infrastructure does not automatically make the world a more just and more equitable place, it is an essential prerequisite. So we have to better support that work because we really need it. So I believe that there are a few things that we can do to make digital infrastructure projects and also FOSS projects in general thrive better. And the first one is, of course, to, to also scrutinize these kind of hidden mechanisms within our communities to scrutinize how positions are valued and why or why not and how we can balance that a little better. We also, of course, just have to acknowledge that community building is hard. So it's better if we share what worked and what didn't, and if we add that to the exchange that we are already having. And the last one, and this is also something that, that we actually proposed to the funders in our report, um, I think there are ways to share the load. We can't expect all the projects to fund their own organization, have their own financial department and their community management group and whatnot. But there is um, one aspect, one approach um, with fiscal financial administration, which is the fiscal sponsorship, where you have specific entities that um, that have expertise in financial administration and that take that part over, keep the discussion going, but basically liberate smaller groups uh, of the burden to have to administer their own finances. And I believe we could do that in, in many more respects. Um, the open source design network, it goes into a similar direction where they pool expertise from designers that are well acquainted with open source projects where you can, you know, just, just send them an email and ask for support. You don't have to have a host of designers on your team necessarily. And I believe that is something to go forward to build a system, kind of a backbone with the expertise and the knowledge and the resources that can help FOSS communities to do what they are good at, to provide the tools that we all need and should use much more. And with that, I'm already uh, at my end. Thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Elisa. You can reach me under the following uh, emails uh, and uh, also check out the work that we are doing at Super. It's super with three rs.net. So thank you very much. Sorry, Lisa. Um, I think there's another little, uh, another little connection issue. Let's see if you can hear me. If this comes through to you, uh, I can hear you. For a second. 
I can hear you all right. We'll just have to wait until the whole thing has unstuck itself, I think. Uh, but I think she'll, she'll come back in a second. I'm not sure whether that's on your end or on my end. Okay, let's see. Now I have to ask uh, people. Um, ah, I was the only one who had issues with uh, hearing Elisa. Can somebody confirm in the in the chat? Ah, I'm okay. Then I have to apologize. Um, let me just quickly reload. I'll be back in one second because. I will just reload quickly. I'll be back in one second. I guess Bianca, do you want to come on? Hi, it's Paula from OFE. I just uh, assigned Bianca as a presenter so we can just move on. Also, thank you for the presentation. It was great. Can you all see my screen and hear me? Yes, your screen is loading. We hear you and we see you. Okay. Okay, it's still loading. It's uh, it's actually taking quite some time. Okay. Okay. Hello again. Thanks, Paolo, for jumping in. All right. I guess we're back on track. So uh, I will just let Bianca take the word for her presentation. And thanks to Elisa for the very interesting presentation. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks. Sylvan, thanks everyone for the opportunity and it was very nice to be, I think I'm the last one, right? <laughs> I think, it, yeah, it's very nice to be after, to be with in this session with Elisa because our work is really very connected. And I had in the last minute included one slide to make this connection a little bit more clear. So uh, I am Bianca Trinkenreich and you pronounce it very well, thank you. Uh, Sylvan, and um, I am a graduate student, uh, third year PhD student at NAU here in Arizona. I'm from Brazil, I'm not American, and uh, I'm also a research assistant. And this work is a study that was published, uh, accepted in uh, Transactions of Software Engineering. It's about the pots of gold in the end of the rainbow, and we studied what means being successful for open source contributors. Okay, how did we go until there? And then I'm coming to the connection with the comments that I'm seeing in chat and with the Elisa awesome presentation. Uh, open source is changing. Open source is, is not the same from 20 years ago, but until now, there are some famous preconceptions that open source is only for developers. And why are those preconceptions still existing? It's because usually, usually not all, but usually the metrics and the recognition are based on code. So they are based on how much code you can produce, how much code you can commit. And, and this uh, helps this preconception to still exist. Okay, however, the landscape has changed and now the open source communities and projects have and need different roles there. Uh, this graph is from a previous study that we have uh, investigated the many hidden roles that exist in open source software projects. So besides the project centric roles and the developer here in, in green, we have many other roles and the, the community is being such a diverse uh, ecosystem that we need to start recognizing all the many roles that exist. So the, as you can see, the coder is part of 
uh, we categorized the roles into community-centric and project-centric ones. So the coder is inside the project-centric, and together with him or her, uh, or they, exist also the designer, the documenter, the release manager and project manager, and many other uh, roles that are there to help the developer and help the community to, to develop and deliver a better software. But besides the project-centric roles, uh, we have also found many community-centric roles that you have also, that you have, for example, the community founder when you, uh, when you create the new community and also the community manager. And the community manager is growing and growing because the ecosystem is also growing. So we, we can see that uh, having different roles People can have also different motivations and different career goals. We are going to a diverse set of contributors. And uh, this is the new slide that I included because I wanted to talk a little bit about the, this study that we investigated, the different pathways that contributors follow until they achieve the success. So this, this study was based on, on interviews. We had interviewed 17 contributors that were speakers at the open source conferences and we selected them because it's one of the many and i'm going to get there the many ways to to measure success someone who is speaking at the conference um and then we interviewed 17 of, of them and besides uh, and in the interview we asked them to tell uh the story of their career until they are now since the beginning until the point they are now so those contributors included contributors from from uh small small projects big projects companies that include open source areas like ibm and microsoft but also big uh and large communities as linux kernel and they told us the careers the, their career story and we could understand there are many pathways until like here the circle to until the way they are now so uh the, the colors indicate if the if the role is related to not open source which is the orange we if the role includes some consuming open source which is the yellow or if the role is already a contributor to, to open source which is the pink so we could see that many of them started lurking open source. We consolidated many kinds of lurking inside here. In the paper, we have more details. Uh, and some, but some of them went directly to be a community founder. Some of the other uh, went directly to be a community manager. So there are many pathways to be successful, many pathways to start being a contributor. And we also categorize it those roles into coder or non-coder so we can we can understand the many pathways in the paper we also discuss uh the fluid movements between being coder and being non-coder or both at the same time and after that we started to think okay we interviewed 17 inter 17 contributors they were speakers at open source they are meant to be like considered successful from the point of view of their communities, at least. But do they feel being successful? What is success? What means being successful in open source? Is that only like being a speaker at a conference or not? OK. Then uh, why did we start to, to investigate that? Because the success may, must be recognized like uh, more than only being a speaker, more than only just the amount of code that we produce. And what means success? Then we are doing a lot of social science together with uh, technical and open source. And then uh, the success like achieving at any point of your life and your experiences, the professional results that you desire. I can understand success by one way, you can understand by another. And this will drive our decisions Per, per life. Uh, this will drive our education choice, our professional choice, 
and the, the, the motivations and also the, the community that we want to contribute and our decisions to stay or to move to another one. And this is the, the goal of this study, understanding what means success, being successful, not the success of the project, but being successful yourself by the point of view of open source contributors. And what did we do? We started with 27 interviews and included uh, the speakers of the, the conference, but also maintainers mm -hmm. of like well-known projects and people who are already in a core uh, position in the community. So we interviewed 27 contributors. We did the, the open code, the qualitative analysis. Then we did a reanalysis using an existing model of career success from the psychology, the human resources. And then we ran a survey with more 193 contributors from many, many and different communities. And those were like not chosen, like any, any contributors in the beginning of career and in the end, doesn't matter. And we asked it, what means success to you? Uh, after that, we did our analysis of the survey and some quantitative analysis, like descriptive analysis, because we didn't ask, we asked open questions. What is success to you? So the person could answer the first, the first thing from the top of the head, but uh, could not remember all. So we did descriptive analysis to understand the, um, how the, demogra the different demographic uh, consider success. And then we came to this model, which is uh, a model with four quadrants uh, for created by two dimensions. As you can see, the, the interpersonal and intrapersonal dimensions is the, the relation if, of the, the, the meaning of success. If it's only to me, it's only for yourself, or it relates with the external world. It's something that is related to others and the effect, the uh, horizontal way, the effect in one side and achievement affect are the subjective uh, perceptions of success and success and the achievement are the objective, what can be measured. Uh, this, this big square with the 10 regions, cooperation, recognition, perceived, uh, this comes from the existing model and we could, uh, we could fit all the 26 de the definitions of success to this, the, these regions. So we are using an ex existing model from the, human, the social sciences to explain what means success to open source contributors. And I'm going to each of one. So the first quadrant means interpersonal with affect. What means that? It's like the feelings, the subjective perceptions external to myself so it, it's it's subjective it's perception but it also interacts with the external world and then we could see many definitions of success uh, related to cooperation cooperate work with others which is the core from open source communities and co open source contributors right so have having contact something to me is like having contacts in different communities helping the sustainability, provide opportunities for my colleagues to grow, mentor and develop the team who is with me. So those who are categorized inside the cooperation. Also the, the outreach, like uh, providing perceived contribution, serving society, impacting users, making people people's life easier. So you could see that many definitions were not only by your, for the only yourself, but also interact with others and which, and, and this is what made us to decide using this model, which it was very interesting to explain all those perspectives of success. <clears throat> and the recognition, the recognition was really, really uh, cited by the, um, the contributors being recognized by other people, being famous, having my name well known, being awarded by my for my efforts so for the second quadrant we go to the other side also still interpersonal still the relation with the external world but definitions of success that are more objective 
they are measured. They are possible to be measured. So factor contribution was like, uh, something to me is bringing as much contributions as I can, as much uh, objective measured or selling products or services upon open source. I will be successful when I can do that. Also like performance, uh, when, when people said, uh, success to me is being able to release a new version or a new release uh, uh, of the project every six months or every one year, every three months, it's like also like performance being measured by the results and set the goals and, and achieve those goals. And advancement, advancement is an interesting one, which includes salary increase. Salary increase is related to money, but money was uh, one interesting um, definition of success that could fit to two regions of success. And I'm going to get there. So the first region that fits money was when people said, being successful to me is having my salary going up, earning more money, being in the top level of a community uh, hierarchy, or being part of a famous community. Look, this is different from recognition, because here the person says being part of a famous community, like being part of Linux kernel, being part of Microsoft, being part of Google, and the other is like, being recognized my me from my efforts me being famous so those were very dynamic and nuanced conceptions of success and here we have like also receiving job offers and going and uh, choosing the next step of the career being able to choose the next step to me is being like being successful and here we we are now going to talk about the intrapersonal side so it's the definitions of success that, is, that are related to yourself. So the self-developing, uh, uh, when I learn new skills, successful to me is being able, being able, learning and being able to, to join any type or any size of open source projects. So be prepared to serve as a core member, as a maintainer or any other core member of the community. And creativity is like having making something extraordinary bringing new ideas bringing new uh yeah new ideas making something innovative being bringing innovation to the project and then the last the last quadrant which is affect with interpersonal is the only yourself and the perceptions uh subjective perceptions of success uh in the model we have two two regions which one is Satisfaction, being successful to me is being happy, is belonging to a place. It's like being able to express myself, have more friends, is satisfaction. And security brings the money back. So security here is when the person says, being successful is living from open source, is not only contributing, but making my own sustain from open source, you know? So here we have the, the money concept again, but here is representing security, is representing using open source for your own sustain and not having this in parallel or uh, as a volunteer. So, so being successful for those people is making a living from open source. Okay. And, and then, and then what do what can you do with those definitions? So we we use as implications of the study many recommendations for uh for open source communities who, to support the different, to see, recognize, and support the different definitions of success. So you can, uh, for example, for people who, who aim to be recognized by others, you need to create like meritocracy and hours and badges for different contributions, for those who answer questions, who discuss issues, who are building new content for training. And then you are going to attend also uh, the creativity, because here people who understand that success success is being creative, and you recognize that you are going to to help them to create new content for training, and you are going also to to help another area of self developing and pro providing like 
learning models, manuals, and skill-specific mentoring, not only technical. And the recognition here in the app can engage more contributions. So you can help people to provide more factual contribution to the projects. So we we understand that those those implications and those suggestions can be integrated in a way to to provide what many different contributors want as the success. So the success is a concept. This is my last slide. The, the success is a concept that is, when said, is multifaceted. As you can see, recognition money can fit in different uh, regions depending what on what it means uh, for the person and can go well, well beyond of only being a core member or a presenter at the conference or a maintainer. Uh, we need to recognize those different contributions and the dominant view that successful open source contributors is only hackers is not adequate anymore. Even the point of view of coders, because when we segmented the analysis, we could see that even coders consider many other definitions of success than only being the maintainer. And the perceptions of success, they mean, they can mean future career goals. So if, if a person is has the motivation has the, the perceptions of success of making a living from open source and the, this person is not making this living in the community that is contributing today there is a big risk for for this person to go to another community that offers this so we can use those perceptions of success to support uh the retention and avoid contributors to leave and this is my next uh, my next idea of research. I am now, as a next step, I am researching the connections between the, the perceptions of success, the motivations, the sense of belonging, and uh, the challenges being faced, and the intention to live. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bianca. Um, it's very interesting. Again, very, uh, I really had to. Um, uh, make sure ah, my webcam doesn't work, so you will only hear me for one second. Um, I really have to make sure that I uh, keep my attention up. Very dense presentation, but uh, full of information. Um, I'm wondering, uh, there's a slide. Yes, uh, we can make them available. Um, there was a big discussion now, of course, happening um, in the chat um around uh you know what's the what are the right steps i'm wondering if you have some recommendations um that uh you would like to share because it's a very a very very good analysis very uh, comprehensive analysis mm -hmm. but i'm wondering mm -hmm. if you also have some thoughts on what what could do to tackle it uh, i think the first and more i don't know if the more important but yeah the more important is to recognize that people can want more than being the maintainer and then uh, when you recognize that you can understand in your community what means success for them okay some some uh, uh suggestions they are not so complicated and they can help to retain many people as they were more cited, you know. So making explicit here in the right, making explicit uh, their cr criteria and rules for promotion is very important because people want, when people want to get up to, to keep the top level in the community, if they don't know how to get there, they can be demotivated, you know. So this is one part of this side that is usually not transparent in the community. How can you become a core member? How? Only be, be, being known, how, how can you get there? And this can be connected to the recognition because you, you can create a pathway to the core member. Oh, you need to keep this, this and that steps and also create recognitions for the different, different steps, you know? So I think, the, the two more important things here is like making explicit the rules to be promoted and also recognizing the many different roles, or not only the, the coder. I cannot hear you, Silva. You are mute. I am on mute. Everybody has to do that and make that mistake once. Um, 
Uh, it's very interesting and a reflection, maybe a reflection, maybe from my side, just from uh, reading a bit about this book, you know, the rise of the meritocracy, because there, in that book, and it speaks, of course, in a more general context, but it's still, I think, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, interesting, uh, because there, in the book, um, he speaks about a part of society that is not being, um, not being, uh, let's say, appreciated, not being mm -hmm. valued. Um, based on some definition of value you know you can you, one can make a decision on um how that is being defined and of course it leads to a lot of frustration it leads to a lot of frustration as you have also now mentioned in regard to to, to open source um and um it's a broader again a broader uh, uh reflection but you know maybe today we also see something like that uh, in broader society uh, a lot of frustration on parts of society that feel they are being uh, taken out of decision-making processes, they're not being heard, um, and um, are not um, not feeling like they are a part of um, a desirable part of society. Mm -hmm. um, people in this room are very likely not part of that group, considering what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, um, but the impact on society that that has um i think is quite significant and quite relevant again a bit of a broader reflection but i did uh did have to think about it now that you talked about it um mm -hmm. and it's quite uh, it seemed well it's probably difficult to to argue that it's not a, a little bit dangerous society i'm thinking if people want to come in there's i can see there's a lot of people now typing in the in the chat it's also completely fine for you to unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you want to talk uh, that's completely uh, that's completely welcome too. We don't only have to have this um, uh, um, uh, slightly asynchronous uh, conversation yeah, between here and uh, and the chat. Well, otherwise, also if there's any further questions, that maybe just give people like a, uh, give people a second to uh, to see if there's any further questions. Um, yeah. How. It's quite early for you still, right? Because you're in Texas? I'm in Arizona. Arizona. Oh I, yeah. oh, I asked the question before. 8.30. It's 830. okay. Ah, okay. That's all right. That's all right. At I least can... you're still fresh. Everybody else is already. Oh, it's been, it's been oh, yeah. five hours. <laughs> but I was so stressed about getting up and being ready. I have a small daughter here. So I was like, be there. Don't be quiet. And don't... <laughs> but I mean... <laughs> yeah. Silona, I, I will provide the slides to Sylvan and he can uh, share with all of you, okay? Yes, exactly. And then have, I have the links, the link for the two studies. So the first was the hidden figures, the study about the pathways, mm -hmm. the pathways to success. So we call it the hidden figures because uh, making like a connection with the movie. I don't know if you all uh, watch it. It's a movie. Hidden Figures is a movie about the women in NASA who uh, are black yeah. women in NASA who were not recognized by the, their work. And we thought about using this. Yeah. <laughs> I love Hidden Figures too. <laughs> and we used this title in the first paper because we wanted to make awareness about the many roles that exist in open source and the many pathways to success. And then the second slide, the second study, which is this one, the pots of gold, is like, okay, we preconceived that such success is like being in the spot, but what else? Mm. And this is what um, became the, the pots of gold. Mm. Uh, my PhD student is related to increasing diversity in open source. Uh, the diversity aspect that I'm focusing in is gender and women as the subpopulation, but increasing diversity as a, as a whole. And I'm using those human factors to understand what makes people stay and remain or leave. So this is mm -hmm. going to be my next study, mm -hmm. uh, connecting the sense of belonging with all those uh, human factors and the intention to leave, to try to find some connections. Mm -hmm. And yeah. That's, it. That's really fascinating. And, and actually, now that you say hidden figures, um, you know, the pandemic also gives one a reflection on hidden figures, you know, uh, let's say uh, um, jobs or um, activities that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about what do politicians talk about, we need more software engineers, we need more, you know, stuff that we also talk about. 
uh, and then something happens and suddenly you realize that uh, some uh, of the jobs that might not be always in the public eye and not always be a priority mm -hmm. uh, are extremely important. Oh, yeah. uh, so it's also uh, a very good reminder. If uh, I would choose see... like a next step, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. So no, 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 go ahead. Just like having all those people here, if you have like students or you yourself want to so this something that is not very explored yet in research is how to recognize the different kinds of contributions you know mm -hmm. uh the there are some stack overflow recognize a little bit like those who answer questions with badge and, and uh, but it's not easy it's not yeah. big, why it's not easy because it's not easy to measure the different types of contributions that one does when it's not related to code code is like i i think i read something in the when elisa was speaking measuring code in github is like almost lazy it's like the easy one i can measure the, the commits i can measure mm. uh, how, how many patches you submit how many patches you can commit but what else what if it, and the people who, who work with community managers they work hard then how can you measure everything you need mm -hmm. to mine blogs what are you going to mine to measure that it's not easy so this is this can be a, a own research only this part recognizing the different mm -hmm. contributions you know and dividing by different types of contributions because it's hard to mine it's like a, a many yeah. many uh, parts of contribution it's not only in github you know yeah yeah, yeah. So it, it can be uh implications for researchers too mm -hmm. yeah Absolutely. Uh, and um, uh, Vittorio, uh, interesting what you write um, on meritocracy, complex and dangerous, and um, uh, specifically on the point of rejecting the authority mm -hmm. of science, which I, you know, it's very interesting because of course, I, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, I believe in science. Um, um, but I also wonder if there's a um, uh, an approach that can marry, let's say, um, um, the a certain uh, critical view of how these values are being assigned while at the same time not being unscientific you know we're we're discussing for example this this presentation i cannot call unscientific um you have to you have to actually work yourself through all of these uh, graphs um i don't <laughs> i'm sure that's not what you mean obviously vittorio uh, but i do think you know it's worth a discussion on kind of where um, um what um how such a model can look like. I see Johan has actually now asked a question to you, Bianca. Have you worked with the mm -hmm. chaos community in implementing exploring metrics related to these we, different aspects? Oh, yeah. We didn't start working on that, but I, yes, I know the chaos. I have introduced it and uh, two or three of the interviewees are uh, core members of chaos too. So we, I didn't start working on measures for that because I had to like take care of the other part of the PhD. But uh, yeah, I know the chaos and I really like this community and the work they do on metrics. Fantastic. They are also working on something to recognize different kinds of contributions. Mm -hmm.